we have already read our text for the past for this more afternoon. We won't read it again. Dear brothers and sisters, why does the Lord hate pride? We all know that God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble, but why is this the case? We saw in Zephaniah 2 verse 3 that it is the humble of the land who will be hidden in the day of the Lord's anger. That means that those who are not humble, the proud, will have to face God's anger. But why? The answer lies in the Lord's description of the humble. Those who do His just commands. The humble are those who acknowledge the Lord as their Lord, as a God and ruler over all creation. They acknowledge that His commands are just. They seek Him and seek to do His will, humbly submitting to Him as God. However, The proud are those who do not acknowledge the Lord as God. Some may call themselves worshipers of God, but in reality they do not treat Him as the Lord. They follow in the rebellion of our first parents, choosing to follow our own rules, making their own judgments about what is good and evil. In their pride, they think that they know better than God, and even that they can do without God. All those who do not acknowledge the Lord as God are proud. They oppose God, and therefore God opposes them. In our passage, the Lord continues to deal with the proud and the humble. God's Word comes to us this afternoon with the following theme. On the day of the Lord, He will destroy the proud, but give rest to the humble. And we'll look at three points. First, the proud of a nation is destroyed. Secondly, the proud of his people destroyed. And thirdly, the humble of all people given rest. On the day of the Lord, he will destroy the proud, but give grace to the humble, but give rest to the humble. The proud of a nation is destroyed. At the start of chapter 2, God called the humble of His people to seek Him because the cities of the Philistines would be laid waste. There would be no hope of salvation from God's wrath for those outside of the covenant. Those in the covenant who were not humble, the proud, would be destroyed just like the proud nations who did not recognize God as their Lord. And now the Lord turns to address the Philistines, Moabites and Ammonites, as well as the Assyrians. The Philistines, sometimes called Cherethites, were those who inhabited the plains of the sea coast west of Judah. They were Judah's constant enemy who did not acknowledge that God was the Lord. The Lord also calls them Canaanites. And here is where the reason for God's anger against them becomes a bit more evident. Canaan had been allotted to God's people, including the territory of the Philistines. They were to be wiped out because of their sin against God. The five cities of the Philistines had been allotted to the territory of Judah. And yet here we are, 800 years later, and the Philistines are still there. God's people... In the meantime, it was only a remnant of the mighty nation it had once been. The ten tribes had gone into exiles about 60 years earlier. Assyria had made multiple attacks on Judah, at one point even capturing King Manasseh and taking him to Assyria. And now the Lord has declared that He will wipe out Judah. Would there be any, would there still be Canaanites in the land when God's people were gone? Would the proud nation who lived in rebellion to the Lord outlast God's own people? No. There would, be no, there would not be any Canaanites left. In the time of the judges, God had allowed a number of the nations, including the Philistines, to remain in the land to test the peoples. The only reason that the Philistines remained was because God had a use for them. 
And now that they had served their purpose, it was their time to be destroyed. All their land would become pastures and meadows for the shepherds and the flocks. The ruins of their houses would be repurposed as sheepfolds. And who will it be that shepherds their flocks in what was once the land of the Philistines? The remnant of the house of Judah. The humble who have survived the days of the Lord's anger. The Philistines may have held out against God's people for 800 years, but in, their la- and in the end, their land would be possessed by the remnant of God's people. God would not abandon his people. He would restore them. And in the end, the shepherds of Judah with their sheep would peacefully lay down at night in the remnants of Ashkelon. The Lord next turns his attention to Moab and Ammon. Although they were family to God's people, children of Abraham's nephew Lot, they had no love for God's people. When Israel approached the promised land, they hired Balaam to curse him. When the ten tribes had gone into exile, they had taunted them. And they would do the same for Judah. They boasted that they would take Israel's land now that they were gone. In their pride, they had no respect for God or the people that He had chosen for His own. So the Lord of hosts, the Lord over the armies of heaven, the God of Israel, swears an oath declaring, Moab shall become like Sodom and the Ammonites like Gomorrah, a land possessed by nettles and salt pits, a waste forever. Lot and his daughters had survived the destruction of God, Sodom and Gomorrah. However, their descendants, instead of humbly serving the Lord who had shown them so much mercy on that day, proudly went their own way. In their pride, they boasted against the Lord's people. So in return for their pride, they would be made to be like Sodom and Gomorrah. Moab and Ammon proudly boasted that they would take the Israel's land. In their pride, they did not remember who God was. They did not remember how a serious siege of Jerusalem had ended in the days of Hezekiah, only 60 years earlier. In one night, the Lord of hosts had sent one angel and killed 185,000 in the Assyrian camp. One angel, one night, and the Lord has hosts of them at His command. Assyria in their pride had mocked God's people. They had even dared to mock the Lord. And they had learned the hard way that you did not trifle with the Lord. Had Moab and Ammon forgotten? Now the Lord of hosts swears that the remnant of His people will plunder and possess their land. The Lord will be awesome against them. When the Lord of hosts shows His power, they will tremble in fear. They will be awestruck. Then the Lord again shows that the final fulfillment of this prophecy will not just be a local matter. Yes, Moab and Ammon will be destroyed. Yes, the Philistines will be wiped out. But God's victory will be much greater, for He will famish all the gods of the earth, and to Him shall bow down each in His place all the lands of the nations. All the gods of the earth would starve, dwindling to nothing. Every nation, even those at the farthest reaches of the earth, will bow down before Him. All will acknowledge that the Lord, the God of Israel, is the only true God. All will humble themselves before Him. Even Cush. You also, O Cushites, shall be slain by my sword. Cush was a father of Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. Nimrod built the mighty cities of Babel and Assyria and Nineveh. Assyria was a superpower of the day, and its capital was at Nineveh. However, however, even the superpower Assyria would be destroyed. 
It would not take long before Babylon would come and defeat Assyria. Josiah would still be on the throne. The bustling city of Nineveh would be a place for animals to make their home. Her proud buildings with their tall pillars would be ruins. Their capitals, the tops of the pillars, being homes for owls and even hedgehogs. The only sound coming out of the windows will be animal calls. Even her threshold, the foundation, would be ruined. The beautiful cedar lining the inside of her buildings will be exposed to the elements. From top to bottom, her proud buildings would be in ruins. She, who proudly thought that she was the pinnacle of the world, who said in her heart, I am and there is no one else, would become despised ruins. To put this in today's scene, this would be the same as God coming today and with a prophecy that USA would be destroyed, that Washington would be deserted and home to all kinds of animals, that the ruins of the White House would house, be a home for birds and hedgehogs. Not even the most powerful nation on the earth is safe from God's wrath. Today, we cannot go on a holiday to Philistia or to Moab, Ammon, or Assyria. These nations do not exist anymore. And one day, there will be no more trips to Canada, the U.S., Canada, China, Russia, etc. These nations will not exist anymore. Brothers and sisters, it can seem that the governments of this world are limitless in their power. It can seem as if they can ignore God, treating Him as a mere myth, and that they can oppress His people without any fear of retribution. They promote evil and suppress the truth, even threatening God's people with punishment for speaking in defense of the truth. Sexual sin is promoted as a God that must be submitted to and worshipped. The murder of the weak is legislated and defended but woe to those who would speak out against such evils. Yet God tells us that no matter how long He allows them to proudly rule against God and against His people, in the end, all they will get for their pride is complete destruction. They will see that the Lord is indeed God. And that brings us to our second point. Proud of his people destroyed. At this point, God's people might be breathing a sigh of relief. After the destruction prophesied against them earlier, the Lord has turned his attention to their enemies. He has even given promises that the remnant of his people would inherit the land. Maybe the Lord has relented, maybe he has forgotten about their sin. The Lord continues, Woe to her who is rebellious and defiled, the oppressing city. Who is a city? Is the Lord still talking about Nineveh? The Lord continues, She listens to no voice. She accepts no correction. She does not trust in the Lord. She does not draw near to her God. There is only one nation who has the Lord as her God. The Lord is not talking about Nineveh. The Lord is talking about Jerusalem. The Lord has not forgotten their rebellion. They had openly worshipped Baal and Asherah in the temple. Altars to the false gods had been set up in the temple itself. They had openly worshipped the hosts of heaven. Horses and chariots dedicated to the sun were stationed just outside the temple. They had openly rebelled against the Lord, and they did not even try to hide it. The people had no respect for the Lord or His holiness. Instead of being clean, suitable to come into God's presence, they were defiled, defiled by their sins, and almost certainly ceremonially unclean as well. They did not care about God and His holiness. Jerusalem was known as the oppressing city, 
The city of God, chosen as God's resting place on earth, had become known as a place of oppression. The city that ought to have been the prime example of a godly city, a city where all lived in love for their neighbor, diligently following the Lord who had made his home there, was instead a city where they oppressed one another. And she was not willing to change. She was not willing to listen to anyone who would speak to her about her ways. She would not accept any correction. No matter how many prophets the Lord sent their way, she turned a deaf ear. And why? Because she did not trust the Lord. Did not trust that the Lord knew what was right, what was good for her. She did not draw near to her God. The city where the creator and ruler of all creation had chosen to live among his chosen people had no interest in having a relationship with the Lord. Just like the Philistines, just like Moab and Ammon, just like Assyria, God's people were no different than the nations around them. Brothers and sisters, before we go on shaking our heads at how in the world Jerusalem could do this to their own God, let us remember that we are not immune from doing the same thing. Many of us know people who we once called brothers and sisters who have turned their back to the Lord. It wasn't long ago that we had to tell our brothers and sisters in the Netherlands that we no longer consider them to be a faithful church, that their sin and decisions were an open rebellion to the Lord. And the temptations that Satan used to draw all these away from God are the same ones we face. It is only by the Lord's mercy that we have not turned away from Him. And if you want to keep following the Lord, and I earnestly pray that we do, we also need to remember our own weakness and that the book of Zephaniah also comes to us today. God is also speaking to us today. Are we listening to His voice? Are we willing to accept correction? Do we trust that the Lord knows best? Do we draw near to our God? While we are listening to what the Lord has to say to Jerusalem, are we asking ourselves whether the Lord is called, also calling us to repent? When the Lord describes Jerusalem, is He also describing us? Brothers and sisters, let us not just shake our heads at Jerusalem. Let us also examine ourselves. The Lord speaks of the leaders of His people. They were those who were tasked to look out with the well-being of their, his, his flock, His children, especially the weak and the vulnerable. However, the officials are roaring lions, like roaring lions, they both frighten and devour the weak of the flock. Her judges were to be impartial, not taking any bribes. However, they were like evening wolves on the prowl to greedily get whatever they can get. Like wolves, they leave nothing till morning, devouring as much as they can get their hands on. Those who were to care for God's flock devoured them instead. The prophets and priests were tasked by God to care for the spiritual well-being of His people. However, the prophets are fickle and treacherous. You could not rely on them to speak the truth. The priests were tasked to ensure that God's standard of holiness was met, instead profaned what was holy. And while they should have taught and upheld God's law, they were those who twisted it and explained it away treating it violently. Those who were to care for the spiritual well-being of God's flock were leading them astray. In contrast to these evil leaders, the Lord within her, the Lord who lived in the midst of Jerusalem, who made His home there, is righteous. He never does injustice. His justice is as reliable as the dawn. You can always count on it. But the unjust rulers of God's people 
know no shame. Even while living in the presence of the perfectly just Lord, they have no realization that they will be condemned for their actions, for destroying God's flock rather than caring for them. And this despite all the warnings God had given them. Not only had He sent them His prophets, but He had also cut off rebellious nations. Their battlements were ruined, their streets empty, their cities were absolutely desolate without a single inhabitant. The Lord had shown them that He was serious. He had given them so much warning. They only had to think about the Canaanites they had dispossessed because of their sin, because of their rebellion against God. They only had to think of their fellow brothers and sisters in the ten tribes. God had sent prophets to warn the ten tribes. He had warned them of destruction at the hands of an angry God. And yet they did not listen. It had been more than 60 years since the ten tribes had been destroyed and exiled. Was that not enough of a warning? The nations around Israel had also suffered when God brought judgment on them. Wasn't that enough of a warning for Judah? The Lord laments. I said, surely you will fear me. You will accept correction. Then your dwelling would not be cut off according to all that I have appointed against you. But all the more, they were eager to make all their deeds corrupt. The Lord is not happy that His people are living in rebellion. He does not want to punish them. Oh, how He wishes that they would repent. But just like Israel, Judah does not listen to the prophets. Even though their cities, their country was surrounded by empty cities that showed God's justice. Instead of responding to the Lord with repentance, they responded with being all the more eager to sin. Therefore wait for me, declares the Lord, for the day when I rise up to seize the prey. The leaders of God's people had treated his flock like prey, and now they would be treated like prey. The just Lord who dwelt in the midst of an unjust people was going to put an end to all injustice. Not only in the injustice among his people, but all the injustice in the entire earth. For my decision is to gather nations, to assemble kingdoms, to pour out my, on them my indignation, all my burning anger, for in the fire of my jealousy, all the earth shall be consumed. The Lord was going to put an end to all the injustice in the world. In their pride, even God's own people did not listen to Him, thinking they knew better, thinking that they could live without Him. But the Lord is jealous and will not put up with being ignored. So now the Lord declares, that he will mete out his justice by consuming all the earth in the fire of his jealousy. And that brings us to a third point. The humble of all people given rest. The Lord has just declared that he will wipe out the earth. Then he continues with, for at that time, with these words, we would expect a further description of his wrath. However, what we get is quite different. For at that time, I will change the speech of the peoples to a pure speech, that all of them may call upon the name of the Lord and serve him with one accord. Instead of destruction, we now get a prophecy of restoration. In the face of the dreadful judgment against the proud, the Lord comforts the humble with a promise of a new life Marked by a changed speech, the Lord would change the speech of the peoples. The last time the Lord changed the speech of the peoples was at the Tower of Babel. There He had changed their speech because of their pride. In their pride, they wanted to make a name for themselves rather than disperse over the whole world. However, they, then the Lord came down to them and changed their language, and they did disperse. However, they continued to be proud and soon invented other gods. And now the Lord 
declares that he will change the peoples, the speech of other peoples to a pure speech. Their speech would come from a heart that humbly serves the Lord with one accord. All the earth will faithfully serve the Lord. These peoples would come from beyond the rivers of Cush, the rivers of Assyria. The Lord calls them my worshipers, the daughter of my dispersed ones. At this point, we need to ask, who exactly is the Lord speaking of? We have just heard about all the earth and the peoples in the plural, which seems to be speaking about all nations, but now we have the daughters of my dispersed ones, which is clearly talking about Israel. Well, as the Lord often does in prophecy, He crafts His words to speak of two or more events at the same time. The initial fulfillment of this prophecy was around the time of the return to exile. The Lord's remnant, the daughter of those who went into exile, returned to Jerusalem and brought His offerings. Not long afterwards, during the time of Esther, Many people joined themselves to the people of Israel, declaring themselves to be Jews. This is at the time of the declaration of that Israel was allowed, the Jews were allowed to destroy their enemies on the day that Haman had declared the Jews would be destroyed. After Pentecost, the number of people from other nations added to Israel to the church continued to grow, and even as it is today. God's people would consist from people of all nations. However, there's still something lacking. We are not pure of speech. The proud have not been removed. The final fulfillment of this prophecy is at the end time, in the day of the Lord. On that day, the humble will experience a new reality Their past deeds of rebellion against the Lord, all their sin will no longer put them to shame. Their sins will be wiped away. What a relief to no longer be burdened by sin. The proud and haughty will be removed from the Lord's mountain. The humble will no longer kneel to deal with all those who selfishly only live for themselves instead of for the Lord. There will be no no more corrupt officials and judges to make their life miserable. How pleasant that will be. The only ones remaining on the holy mountain on Jerusalem will be the humble and the lowly. All those around them will be fellow worshipers of the Lord. All will depend on the Lord for the security and not on idols or foreign nations. There will be no more injustice No crime whatsoever. There will be no lying or deceitful tongues. You can trust everyone around you. With the Lord as their shepherd, they shall graze and lie down, and none shall make them afraid. The Lord's flock will be pure. Life of the Lord's flock will be pure, peaceful bliss. It will be a new Jerusalem. Dear brothers and sisters, the reality that is prophesied is promised to us as well. When Christ died and rose again, He secured this future. Through His death, our sins are wiped away. Already now we can live without the shame of our past rebellious sins. At His ascension into heaven, Jesus was given the authority over all creation and is bringing people from all nations to Himself. Through His Holy Spirit, He is renewing us, those whom He has called, so that our speech becomes more and more pure. Already in this life, we can experience the start of this prophecy's fulfillment. And one day, we will experience it in full. One day, we shall be free from all remaining sin. All the proud shall be removed. Those who call themselves Christians, but instead freed off the weak, they'll be gone. The nations who refuse to acknowledge the Lord as God will be be destroyed. Those who taunt the Lord's people, those who try to destroy the Lord's people will be gone. We, as a flock of the Lord, will inherit the land 
And with the Lord as our shepherd, we will graze and lie down, and none shall make us afraid. Brothers and sisters, one day the proud will be destroyed. The proud nations and the proud who call themselves Christians will be destroyed by the fire of the Lord's jealousy. The future is terrible for them. However, in the face of the Lord's terrible judgment against the proud, we who are humble, who acknowledge the Lord as our God and shepherd, have a wonderful future to look forward to. Praise the Lord for His great mercy towards us. Amen. The Lord who will pour out His wrath on the proud is also the loving shepherd of his sheep. Let us sing hymn 56, all stanzas, loving shepherd of thy sheep.